There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indie Media. Hey, welcome back. We're uh, Indie TV, Rochester Indie Media. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm filling in for uh, Don, the barefoot host. Uh, I, I have shoes on, but I'll do my best to uh, to fill her shoe for her bare feet, I should say. Um, today we're talking to Richard Katsky, from, who's a civil rights lawyer with uh, American United for Separation of Church and State. Did I get that right? You got it. Sure. And uh, he's in Rochester because uh, he's uh, uh, arguing a case um, in Greece about uh, sectarian prayer. Is that? That's right. Uh, sectarian prayer at the town, town board meetings. Okay, can you just talk a little bit about the case so that people understand it? Sure. Well, um, for about the last 10 years, what uh, the town of Greece has done is that at its monthly board meetings, which is like the city council, um, they open the meeting by having a clergy member come in and deliver a prayer. Well, what they do is they say whatever the clergy member wants to say is just fine, and uh, they've They've invited 104 times, they've invited Christian clergy, never anybody from a minority faith, and they let the clergy give uh, what are called sectarian prayers, prayers that are identifiable with one faith, in this case Christianity. Um, and what the Supreme Court said back in the early 80s was that, uh, was that although you can have certain sorts of prayers at city council meetings to solemnize the occasion, you have to do it in a way that really um, encompasses the community, binds people together, and when you choose language and prayers that are, are specific to one particular religion, what you're doing is excluding other folks. You're saying, if you're not of our faith, you don't belong, get out. We don't want you here. So the case is really challenging this town's use of sectarian prayers and telling people who aren't of the, min of the majority faith uh, that they don't belong at those meetings. Okay, so how did the case come about? What was, uh, what was the history behind it? Well, what, what happens in, I, in pretty much all uh, civil rights cases, people think that they're sort of manufactured. That isn't really true. What happens and what happened here was a couple of citizens from Greece who regularly go to town board meetings. They go, to, they go because they're interested in what the town government is doing and sometimes because there are particular issues that they want to advocate for. Um, and they discovered that there were these prayers, at meeting after meeting after meeting. And each time they would find that the prayers were, uh, were specifically Christian and, uh, and sometimes the ministers would ask everybody to say the prayer together. They, f they felt uncomfortable. Um, one, of the, one of the plaintiffs, one of the folks I'm representing is Jewish and the other one is an atheist. And both of them said that we just feel excluded by these prayers. It doesn't seem right. So they called us uh, to say, is this okay? Is what the town is doing permissible? We looked at it. We looked at the prayers and the law and, and came back to them and said, no, it isn't. Uh, uh, let us try to help you. We started out by sending a letter to the town explaining what the law was and asking the town to change its practice, just to ask the clergy members it invites to please give non-denominational ecumenical prayers. The town refused. So uh, the, the plaintiffs ended up deciding that, they, that this was an important enough issue for all the people of Greece that they wanted to challenge it, and we went to court. So uh, one thing I want to get out, out of the way pretty quickly, um, because reading newspaper articles and, and reports is the question of what sort of prayer um, you're trying to, to stop and what, try, what sort of prayer aren't you trying to stop. You know, a lot of reports say that you're against Christian prayer. You don't want any Christian prayer. Is, 
Is that accurate? Uh, no. The issue is, the issue of sectarian prayer means that prayer needs to be ecumenical. It needs to encompass lots of different faiths. Um, this isn't about being anti-Christian or, and certainly not about being anti-religious. It's about recognizing that not everybody in the community is of the same faith. Even among Christians, people pray in different ways. Uh, and we need to respect those differences by saying that when we, when we have invocations at, at, pub, at uh, public board meetings, um, which is the one time, by the way, and the only time that government is allowed to present prayer, it needs to do it in a way that's sensitive the, to the whole community. Um, what, what, the, what the courts have said, and what I think, is, what I think really matters is that um, you're not supposed to make some people feel like outsiders. Uh, what I said before is that, uh, is, that our, uh, is that the people I represent felt like the town was telling them, you don't belong if you don't believe what we do. And that's precisely what government is never supposed to do. Um, it doesn't matter whether the prayer is Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or anything else. The issue is that prayer, is, prayer when it's allowed, is supposed to speak to all of us and not only some. Mm -hmm. so so I think that speaks to this. So w what's at stake here? What, what are you trying to get? If you win this case, you know, what sort of improvements do you, do you see happening? Well, what, what should happen is that the town will, for, if the town wants to continue having prayers, and the town has that choice and it's perfectly permissible, but if the town wants to have prayers before board meetings and it wants to invite clergy, it's going to have to do two things. One is it's going to have to be fair in the way it goes about invi inviting clergy. It can't select only Christian ministers 104 times in a row. It has, to, um, it has to have a fair system that recognizes that there are lots of different faiths in the community. And, and more important than that, it has to say to those clergy, we want you to give a non-denominational prayer. We want you to give a prayer that, uh, that doesn't exclude people. Um, and if you can't do that, then we'll go down the list and have somebody else give the prayer instead. That's what we're asking for. Okay, and, and the group you're with is uh, America United for Separation of Church and State. Yes. We actually had them on many, many indie TV shows ago. Um, but can you just talk briefly about what uh, that group does and sure. uh, sort of the mission? Yeah, Americans United for Separation of Church and State was founded in 1947 uh, by actually a, uh, I believe it's a Presbyterian minister, but a Protestant minister anyway, who got worried that the public schools, he was from Kansas, got worried that the public schools in Kansas weren't really public, they weren't really open to everybody because there was so much religion being put into the public schools that not everybody um, really belonged anymore. And he thought that every kid deserves a, a fair shot at a public education. So he came to Washington and founded Americans United in order to say that our public schools ought to be kept public and open to everybody. And that means that religious choices are ones that people make in the home. The parents make for their children. The school isn't supposed to impose on them. Well, that's what Americans United has been doing ever since, except that we do lots of things in addition to what goes on in the schools. The important message always, though, is, and, and in all the cases that we, that we work on, is that religion is a, is a deeply personal and incredibly important matter. It's a matter that you decide for yourself and for your own children, and that government isn't supposed to be imposing those choices on you. Okay, great. Um, well, that's, that's it for our first segment, basically. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Rochester Indie Media. We just want to always remind people that um, you could go and post to our site, rochester.indymedia.org. Uh, there's a lot of good news there, and also we would love your news, so, so please visit us. Uh, thanks. Let us take this moment to acknowledge our Creator who has set before us this purpose for which we are gathered here today. And silently let us say a short prayer. We thank you, Lord, for a new day. We thank you for life. We thank you for strength. We thank you for our services. Today we gather here to hold this meeting in which we agree to deliberate the affairs that govern this town. We ask you, Lord, for inspiration and wisdom. We ask you for peace. And as we discuss, 
we will be able to come to agreement and then whatever we agreements are be beneficial to all humanity. So we instruct, we entrust ourselves to you, believing that you will be with us from the beginning till the end. And after our discussion here is over, may you lead us back home safely and give us the strength that we may implement what we shall discuss here. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, welcome back to Indie TV. Um, I just want to remind you that you could always catch us uh, every Monday and Thursday on, here on RCTV, 6.30 p.m. And uh, you could also catch us on our website. Uh, again, that's rochester.indymedia.org. And uh, here with Richard from uh, America United. Um, where can people go to get more information uh, on your group? Well, our website is www.au.org. And on the website, we have frequently asked questions, uh, reports on cases, information on, on church state controversies across the country, all kinds of good stuff. <laughs> okay. So um, let's talk more about the, the specifics of the case. Um, sure. You know, where are we right now? Uh, and where do you see, what do you see happening in the near future? Well, the argument yesterday was, was what's called a summary judgment argument. What happens in, in a lawsuit is that um, the, the plaintiffs, the parties who are, who are making the claim, file a complaint that explains what they think is, has gone wrong. The other side responds, and then you start collecting evidence. Um, summary judgment is a procedure where the judge has an opportunity to decide questions when there aren't disputes about what the facts of the case are. When, when there are disputes about the facts, you have to have a full trial, kind of like you see on TV, except that there's no jury in civil rights cases normally. Um, but in, but when there isn't, where there isn't a disagreement about the facts and the question is, what does the law tell us about whether what's going on here is legal or illegal, then the judge can decide that based principally on on briefs, that, uh, documents that the party has parties have filed, giving their legal arguments. That's what happened yesterday. Is that we go before the judge, who then gets to ask us questions to try to round out the information that he has about the case in order to see whether he can decide the case based upon the legal issues. So, if the judge uh, rules one way or the other. Uh, what would be the next steps? Well, the first thing is that the judge uh, can rule, uh, can decide the case if he thinks that there aren't factual questions, or he can say, we really have to have a trial where you have witnesses come in and ask them questions and I get to hear, the, I get to hear their testimony. If he doesn't do that, if he decides the case, then what happens is he'll issue a written ruling, which he said he'll do in about six weeks. That written ruling becomes the decision in the case. Uh, at that point, the losing party has the choice to appeal the decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, which is uh, a, an appellate court that has jurisdiction over um, all of New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. Uh, the court sits in New York, happens to sit in New York City and Manhattan. Uh, that court, three judges would hear an appeal of, uh, of Judge Syragusa's decision. Uh, and that would be the next step. They again make a decision based principally on the law. They don't hear, they hear arguments, but they don't hear witnesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the decision went uh, in your way, let's say, who, who would that affect? What, where, what areas would, would be uh, well, uh, changed um, for that? This court has, the court we argued before yesterday and the court where the case is now, has jurisdiction, has sort of authority over what's called the Western District of Washington. Uh, which. Uh, Washington, excuse me, Western District of New York. I actually know where I am today. <laughs> um, the Western District of New York. Um, what that means is that basically it would be uh, it would be precedent. It would be a uh, controlling decision for part of New York State. Um, it would also be uh, what what lawyers call persuasive authority um, everywhere else in the country. Meaning that other judges who have a similar case and who think that this judge's reasoning was sound uh, would look at it and think. I agree with that. This is a basis to kind of decide the same way, but it isn't controlling over their decisions. If the case is appealed to the Second Circuit, then uh, then that court's decision becomes binding law for New York, Connecticut, and Vermont. And then from there, the next step is if one of the parties wants to ask the U.S. Supreme Court to review it, and if it does, then its decision becomes binding law for the entire country. Okay. So um, let's talk about being a, a civil rights lawyer for. AU, right? Mm -hmm. um, sort of what got you involved? First of all, what got you involved um, 
um, fighting for separation of church and state? Well, everyone who does this sort of work ha has a personal story. Um, mine is, mine goes back to when I was in elementary school, uh, as I think so often does. Those are really formative years for a lot of us. Uh, my sister and I were the, were the two Jewish kids in our public school in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, the school had um, all of the activities that you sometimes think of, the, the, the Christmas concerts and lots of religious things. Uh, we participated in those. My parents didn't want us to, to be excluded and have to sort of sit outside and be left out, so they had us go ahead and participate in those activities. But in my fourth grade class, there was a, there was a classmate, his name was Paul, he was a Jehovah's Witness. And uh, his, his parents, uh, this, all of these activities were also not part of his religion, but his parents, uh, unlike mine, really weren't comfortable with having him participate and he wasn't c comfortable participating. So what the school made him do was to sit out in the empty cafeteria down the hall at those, remember those long tables we all had in our elementary school cafeterias? He would sit there hour after hour every day leading up to the Christmas concerts um, doing nothing uh, because he couldn't participate. And so the, really the reason that I got involved in church-state separation was thinking about Paul sitting there alone and what message that sends to the kids about what a public school is and, and really about what this country stands for. Mm -hmm. I actually went to hippie school. I didn't have the long time. <laughs> uh, I could see that being, being powerful uh, motivation, right? Yeah. So um, what about becoming a civil rights lawyer? When, when did you decide? How, how did you decide? And you know, how do you see that accomplishing your, your goals? Well. Um, not, not only had I thought a lot from the time that I was a, a child about uh, separation of church and state, but I started really in college uh, getting interested in and, th and thinking about civil rights issues. I didn't necessarily think that I was going to be a civil rights lawyer. I thought I would teach. Uh, and um, I went through, I went to law school still with an idea that I would teach. I also went to graduate school in political theory. Um, but I kept getting troubled by what I saw as injustices in the world, and eventually it got to the point where I th felt like I needed to do something. Uh, it, I was able to return to my original interest in, in re religious issues uh, sort of by accident. I went to the Supreme Court to hear an argument. I used to be in a, a private practice where we specialized in cases in the U.S. Supreme Court, and I went to hear the argument where Michael Newdow challenged the Pledge of Allegiance. In, um, in the Supreme Court. I went to hear the argument. I actually started talking to the person behind me in line waiting g to get into the lawyer's section uh, who turned out to be uh, the legal director at Americans United. Uh, I wanted to do, to do some pro bono work for her uh, to provide some free legal service in support of, of her work. And we got along really well and here I am. Now I'm doing it full time for her uh, as, as, a, as a lawyer. Okay, great. And uh, so when we get back, we'll talk about sort of some of the cases you've tried and some of the, sure. the ways that you've, that's played out and uh, also how people can get involved and how people can uh, support these cases. Terrific. See you later on Indie TV, Rochester Indie Media. I'm going to address the camera since maybe people will see it, um, since I don't think my town government really hears me, so I won't address them. Um, I have a lawsuit pending against the town because of the religious practices. I am so outraged at tonight's singling out because I do not believe in what the priest had to say and in praying in Jesus Christ's name. And to make people stand and for this government to allow it, to make people feel that they do not belong in their own town at a public meeting or to feel different is not okay. I don't know what it's going to take for people to understand that people do not, should not feel excluded from their town government and part of their town. And I am, I felt so uncomfortable at this meeting and I shouldn't feel that way because this is my town, I live here, I support this town, and I should not have to feel like this. 
Hi, welcome back to Indie TV. Um, we're talking with uh, Richard from America United for Separation of Church and State about um, his role as a civil rights lawyer. And uh, let's really get into that. So another case you argued was the, the Dover, Pennsylvania case, right? Right. Which was uh, about intelligent design and evolution and, and teaching. Um, can you just give an overview of that case? Sure. Well, what happened there was that um, a, a public school, a public uh, school district in Dover, Pennsylvania, which is a, a little town about 30 miles west of Harrisburg, had decided that it wanted to put creationism into its science class. Um, what the, the school board members decided that they weren't going to teach evol uh, they weren't going to teach evolution uh, unless they could teach creation as well because they were worried that uh, the students of Dover uh, would be brainwashed into forgetting their religion. And so they refused to buy, actually they refused to buy science textbooks for the students uh, unless they could find one that had creationism in it. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1980s, the Supreme Court said that it's unconstitutional to teach uh, religion, to teach, uh, to teach uh, religious views which, uh, like creation in the public schools. But this school board was determined to find a way to do it. So it hooked up with a what's called a faith-based law firm out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, that said, well, don't talk about creationism. Say you're teaching intelligent design. It's this new thing. Uh, and, then you can, and then you can get that into your classrooms. That's what the school board did. And, uh, and 11 parents uh, stood up and said, not, not our school and not our kids. Uh, the families were, by the way, uh, a bunch of uh, represented a bunch of uh, different faiths. There were Christians. There, there was uh, there was a Buddhist. Um, uh, there was an atheist, very, some very religious people and some not religious folks at all, some who believe in creation, some who do not, but all thought that our public schools and our science classes are supposed to teach science, not religion. Religion is something we decide at home for ourselves and, our, for, and for our own kids. So they called up Americans United and also the ACLU of Pennsylvania with whom we worked and those two organizations together with some lawyers from a law firm in Philadelphia uh, brought a case uh, to challenge the school's inclusion of this thing called intelligent design into the science curriculum. And what ultimately happened was after a six-week trial that the, that the judge who was um, a, a federal district judge actually appointed by George W. Bush uh, ended up deciding that intelligent design isn't science, it's religion, and it has no place in the schools. And he also chastised the school board for, um, for plunging the community into this deeply div divisive battle that separated neighbors um, and, and became this massive fight that really was good for no one in the school system. And what he explained along the way, and, and what has always resonated with me, is that both as a historical matter and today, um, the separation of church and state is designed to keep us from fighting with each other, to let us get along peaceably in our communities. And that was what the school district forgot when it was determined to impose the particular religious view of those nine school board members on all the families. Okay, and we'll get back to that hi history of uh, separation. Um, but just first, I guess I want to ask, you know, as you're arguing these cases, um, what can people do? How can people get involved? Um, how can people support what you're doing and, uh, you know, work with you on, on these campaigns? Right? Well, there are all sorts of ways to get involved. Um, as a lawyer, I'll tell you that the most important thing to me is to have people in their communities um, watch what's going on, be aware, and speak up. Uh, whether, it's, whether it's speaking up in their communities or picking up the phone or, or going to our website and contacting us with a complaint mm -hmm. and saying, something seems wrong here. Um, my, my government is doing something that I don't think it should be doing. Uh, I litigate cases all across the country, but I don't know where the problems are unless somebody speaks up. Beyond that, though, as with anything else, having people in their communities stand up in school boards and town councils and, and say what they think and say what they expect of their government always makes a difference. Writing letters to the editor, incredibly important. Um, the folks on the other side of a lot of my cases are tremendously well organized and, um, and are very good at, uh, at public, uh, you know, sort of public campaigns to chastise and disparage the people who stand up for what's right. Uh, and I think the rest of us need to stand up behind them and say, look, we won't stand for 
uh, we won't stand for our communities being uh, torn apart because people who aren't of the same faith that we are uh, get looked down upon. And uh, let us together always great. I just want to remind people they could also post to indie media whenever they want. Um, and that's another way that we could get, get our messages. Absolutely. Out. That makes a huge difference. Indie media is in, it can be incredibly powerful. And there are a lot of folks in indie media we work with very closely because we know that they reach out to, to communities that, um, that don't necessarily um, get, their, get a voice other ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so how do you see you know, your work fitting in with other things? You're, you're a civil rights lawyer. How do you see that fitting in sort of, I guess, the bigger picture in terms of all of these campaigns? you're working on, you know? Like, how do you see your work uh, well, collaborating with other people? Well, as a lawyer, um, you know, you're taught that anytime you're needed, there's been a failure somewhere. <laughs> uh, if, if people stand up in their communities uh, and, and join together and really say, we won't stand for uh, unlawful actions by our government, um, a lot of times that can solve the problems. If, if the media um, presents the issues and really takes public officials to task, it can solve a lot of problems. You need the lawyers only when everything else has failed. Um, so, you know, there's th the most important things are education and activism. And, you know, by the time you get to the law, um, it's when everything else has failed. <laughs> it's a little bit depressing, but we're, we're glad that you, you step in at those points. <laughs> it um, is. Uh, let's just talk a little bit more about history. We said we'd sure. get back to that. Oh, we don't have a ton of time, but just real quick, you know, how do you see historically, how do you see this um, separation of church and state as being important for well, our country and for, for everybody? Well, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and, and the folks who wrote the First Amendment and wrote the Bill of Rights had a particular view, uh, view of government and religion in mind, and they thought that it's not good for either government or religion when you mix the two of them together. Um, it's not good for government because uh, because when uh, religious groups control, then if you're not part of that group, uh, you you end up being oppressed, you end up being an outsider and pushed out. It's not good for religion either because when government is calling the shots, re religious groups um, kind of distort their religious message. They don't have the same religious freedom. Uh, and that, I think, is as true today as it was in, uh, in 1787, 1789. And I think it's just as important today. Okay, well, thanks for coming on the show. That's uh, basically all the time we have. Uh, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Richard from uh, Americans United for separation of church and state. Uh, thanks for coming on, and thanks for all the work you're doing. And uh, just reminding our viewers, uh, stay active in your community. Uh, go to Indie Media, and uh, we'd like to hear more from you.